We are the matriarchal Tichuan Lakota Oyate of the Ocheti Chacoan, an indigenous First Nation people of Turtle Island, the continent known as North America. In togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate, we once roamed freely across the vast prairies and hills of the Northern Great Plains until the occupation of these lands by the expanding United States Empire. Born over thousands of years, our sacred way of life taught us to live, love, and thrive, qualities that endure in our survival today. As we move beyond seven generations in our unyielding struggle to resist genocide, our matriarchal grandmothers are taking back their strength once again. In togetherness with Lakota warriors and people, we speak out for accountability and change to end the atrocities that keep us from healing our nation. Only by understanding our story can our people live free once again. To our relatives from the four directions, we ask you to listen, not only with your ears, but with your hearts. From the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the place you know as South Dakota, this is our story. We did not ask you, white men, to come here. We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did, and their fathers before them. In 1492, the indigenous Arawak people of the Caribbean islands encountered Christopher Columbus of Spain. Columbus wrote in his log, they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus proceeded to unleash a reign of terror unlike anything seen before. When he was finished, eight million Arawaks, virtually the entire native population of Hispanolia, had been exterminated by torture, murder, forced labor, starvation, disease, and despair. Columbus's atrocities with cross and sword were justified by the Christian doctrine of divine discovery and set religious and legal precedent for the invasion and genocide of America's indigenous peoples for the next 500 years and beyond. By 1650, a precarious relationship between the First Nations of the East Coast of North America and New England colonists was collapsing into slaughter and enslavement of native people by settlers who wanted more land and wealth. We find that most of the English colonies sanctioned and encouraged scalping Indians. In 1776, the United States birthed the first 13 states on land taken through the ethnic cleansing of dozens of eastern seaboard tribes. The Declaration of Independence further enshrined the belief of Euro-American settler supremacy by declaring native peoples to be merciless Indian savages. In 1787, the United States adopted its constitution. Article 6 established treaties as the supreme law of the land. Despite this supreme law, treaties with sovereign native nations became slippery promises, easily broken when convenient. In 1823, in the case of Johnson and Graham Lessie v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the First Nation people's right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' divine right of discovery. The United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other Northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, 
the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills and unceded Indian Territory, to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts, and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. Just three years later, in 1871, the U.S. government ceased to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remain upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Ayate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 Treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Randall McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell-or-starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. Despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there, and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills, and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. 
incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S. Henry Benjamin Whipple wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children, as young as two years old, from their families, ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the Sundance, the giveaway, gifts for the bride, feasts, and medicine men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act, which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say, I, instead of we, and this is mine, instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead.
In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally, to sell treaty-protected land, and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken, Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible unable or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wounded Knee, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with a force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten. 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal but did not return the land to our people, offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover, admitted. From the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today. I think what uh, present-day Americans have to learn is that our heroes are not their heroes, and their heroes are not our heroes. And when I went to school, just as you and everyone else in this uh, land. We've all been exposed to the same uh, 
value system, the same uh, perspective on history. The lesson that is there, the very important lesson today for all people, is to realize the value of an alternative perspective. And that is why we are here. That is why the Creator allowed some of us to remain, in spite of all the attempts to destroy us. Every tribe has had their great swamp in that process. Every tribe has had their sand creek. Every tribe has had their wounded knee. The list is endless, and we've all shared in that same experience. I went to a meeting at Wounded Knee in November when there was snow all over, all over the ground, and we were on our way to the burial site. I could not help but think back. And there was a feeling there. There was a feeling that those that were there in the grave were trying to tell me something. And it brought tears to my eyes. And I stood there and, and I, I, there was a spirit that came over and I could feel that spirit. It was the spirit of God. There is a mightier power than kings and presidents who guides the minds of the people. A higher power. The mandates are, are very simple. You know, that we must live in the land that, that the Creator gives to us and look after His gifts so that our great-great-grandchildren will be able to enjoy the same things that we enjoy today. If we look at natural laws in, in, a, in a very simplest form, is that you must drink water to survive. So if you pollute the water so that you uh, can't drink it, then you will perish. And there's no uh, appeal to this if you violate the natural laws. Someday, I fear that the land that we have here now will be taken because some of the treaties state that as long as the water flows and, and the grasses grow, that we will be here. But our rivers are drying up, and when the water is gone, what will happen then? And what's going to happen to my children? Our cultures have been assaulted, our lands have been stolen, but we're still here as a people. And we're fighting the same battles that have been fought for the last 300 years. They're unresolved. And it's up to us to resolve them in a fair and honorable manner. Destiny is not a matter of fate. It's a matter of choice. And we have some choices to be made here. We have the choice of continuing to survive on this planet as Indian people. That's our goal, and we're going to accomplish that. We're going to be here for many, many years to come. Tal Oak of the Narragansett Nation said it was his destiny, perhaps that of all Native people, to be the conscience of America, to see that the tragedy of the past would never be repeated. Hopefully now that we've had a glimpse of the other side of the American story, we too can be a part of that collective conscience. Thank you for joining us. Nearly everyone in the crowd is coughing. Hey, 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 hey.
spitting up due to the heavy amounts of tear gas they're firing into the crowd. <laughs> Here on the front lines of Standing Rock, the DAPL protest. This is a medic. So basically, we have water cannons that are aimed towards our water protectors. So we're having severe cases of hypothermia. They are aiming for people's hands. Uh, I took one patient that had the skin shot off of his finger, so he was down to the bone. They're also aiming for the heads. There was another brother that uh, got shot in the head and was losing consciousness. So it's pretty deliberate and it's it's pretty violent. Woman got shot in the head too, said this gentleman. This is a supply run basically, coming back to the front lines. Shooting uh, smoke bombs and getting into the ground and we were trying to throw them back but it's too hot and it's getting into our face and they're just spraying over there with cold water, freezing cold water and keep on gassing people, keep on macing people. This is not okay, we're here to be peaceful. Putting their lives at stake to protect the water for millions of people. We're really just looking at mass hypothermia right now. We've got trucks getting clothes and getting the wet clothes off of people. Okay, okay. great. Right. She's hypothermic. Well, this is a human rights violation. I love it. Tear gas, tear gas coming down up front. We're not here for violence, and they're responding with violence and cruelty. We're just here to defend the water. They're shooting people with mace, water, and rubber bullets down there. We've already seen a lot of head injuries tonight. People being shot in the head with rubber bullets. It could kill someone tonight. This man just got shot directly in the head. We need medical transport! Shot directly in the head with a rubber bullet. I saw him go down. He was shot in the side of the head by a rubber bullet. Put your head back. Put your head back. We're going to do a little bit of water. Get it all. You gotta keep your eyes open, sir. You gotta keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes all the way open. Okay, brother. They got, they got him covered. He's got a head wound. Oh, He's got a head wound. Okay. Okay. Here. We got water? Yeah, but we only have one. Okay. Come and sit. Put your truck one? up here. Sit, sit, sit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the white top. Right, I'll get it, but that's rough. He also needs a blanket. Who has a blanket? There's a blanket right behind there's him. A lot of no, honestly, when someone came and put a blanket on me earlier, it just pushed the fucking water under my skin and made it cold. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have a fire? I took my jacket off. I have more layers. Put a blanket. Hold back! Two guys hitting the crowd. Hold on, stop, stop. Passenger seat, is it open? There's someone in there that has a... This man was shot okay. directly okay. in the head with a rubber bullet. All right, I'm gonna have, I know it's going to be hard. Could have killed him. He's lucky it. to be alive. Reach the side. Yep. I know, I know. Right. Even if you do that. Throw! Prayers, man. Prayers. You're a hero.